Hello, I'm Sergeant Dwight Johnson with the Umatilla County Sheriff's Office in Pendleton, Oregon. This training is intended for personnel who might be tasked with conducting emergency evacuation notifications caused by wildland fires, but who do not have a fire background. Emergency evacuations due to wildland fires are becoming increasingly common in the West. Several factors are causing this problem. More and more people are moving out into what has been called the wildland urban interface. Climate change has resulted in hotter and drier weather, and aggressive fire suppression has resulted in an abnormal buildup of fuels and what in the past were fire-affected landscapes. It is critical that all personnel involved with wildland fire evacuations have a basic understanding of wildland fire, how it spreads, how to recognize potential hazards, and how to mitigate or avoid safety threats. This training is intended to provide emergency evacuators who are not familiar with wildland fire operations an introduction into some basic wildland fire concepts that will hopefully keep you safer if you find yourself assigned to such operations. This training is basic. We encourage all personnel who may have the responsibility to conduct emergency evacuations to take advantage of any additional training related to wildland fire operations. Fires occur in our wildlands every year and are a natural part of many forest ecosystems. However, the last 10 years have seen a steady increase in the size and intensity of fires. Rates of spread not seen in the past are requiring more rapid evacuations with little time for planning and organization. In recent years, entire communities have been lost in wildland fire incidents, including here in Oregon. This has resulted in responders being put into situations with significant safety challenges. The training object objectives for this presentation are for trainees to understand the three levels of evacuations used in Oregon, as well as most of the other western states, to have a basic understanding of how a wildland fire spreads and what affects that spread, to understand how a wildland fire is managed by experienced wildland firefighters, to be able to conduct a basic fire size up, and to learn ways of staying safe during evacuation operations. In Oregon, as well as most other western states, a three-level evacuation notification system is used. Level 1 advises residents and recreationists to be aware there is a fire in the area, and they may be asked to evacuate or be ready. Level 2 advises to be ready to leave at a moment's notice or be set. And level 3 means leave, go now. The colors green, yellow, and red are used to symbolize these levels. It is always preferable to start with a level 1 advisory and move incrementally if necessary. However, a fire's intent intensity and risks to those in its path ultimately determine what level is used. Fire managers may recommend going immediately to a level 3 evacuation after a fire starts due to its behavior. In most states, it is the sheriff who assumes the lead role in emergency evacuations. In Oregon, search and rescue personnel often assume their responsibility along with law enforcement personnel from various agencies. Evacuation notification not only include residents, but also temporary occupants such as campers and other recreationists. Evacuators should have a basic understanding of fire spread so they can conduct a basic fire size up if no fire personnel are present, and so they can more effectively evaluate fire activity they are encountering. Fire in forested environments is classified into three types, crown fire, surface fire, and ground fire. Fire scientists have identified what is called the fire environment triangle, not to be confused with the fire triangle you might have learned in high school. The fire environment triangle identifies the three primary environmental factors that affect fire intensity and rate of spread. These three legs are fuels, weather, and topography. 
We will start with fuels. Fuel characteristics often determine how dangerous a fire can be. When looking at fuel, the first consideration is what type of fuel is on fire. Types can range from grass to brush to trees to logging slash. All burn differently with different intensities. Within the fuel types, burning is also affected by the size and shape of the fuel. The loading, that is how much fuel is there, and the fuel moisture, that is how wet is the fuel. This can include both dead and live fuels. Here is an example of a slope with relatively light fuel loading. The size and shape of this fuel, that is small short grass along with its light loading, would likely result in lower fire intensity than if the slope were covered with longer thicker grass. On the other hand, this is an area of much heavier fuel loading, including a variety of fuel types. A fire established in this area could potentially be quite intense, rapidly moving, and present a real danger to anyone caught in its proximity. The dryness of the fuel also affects fire intensity. For example, dead trees lying on the ground would normally not burn as intensely in the early summer as they would in the fall after drying out. The moisture content of live fuels also varies. Drought-affected green fuels can have a low enough fuel moisture that they will burn with great intensity. Different types of fuel burn with different intensities. Grass fires, especially those in cured grass, including wheat fields, burn very rapidly and usually result in 100% fuel ignition. However, they are also relatively easy to suppress and a fire line such as a road or cat line is often an effective barrier to their spread. However, be cautious when working close to these fires. They can be deceptive and very dangerous due to their speed. Many tragedies have occurred as a result of grass fires. Brush fires can move as rapidly as grass fires and can be more intense. Brush is especially dangerous in late summer when its live fuel moisture is low. Every year, brush fires wreak havoc in Southern California. Being on a slope with, a, with brush and fire below can be very dangerous. Like grass fires, many tragedies have occurred on brush fires. Although not as rapidly moving as brush fires, logging slash can fuel an extremely intense fire and can be very dangerous to anyone caught in it. However, it tends not to move as fast as the lighter fuels. Timber litter ground fires tend to be much slower and of lower intensity than other fires. Such fires often give evacuators plenty of time to get their notices out. The main danger of such fires is usually being an ignition source for the other more intense fires. Fires in timber can vary from very little ignition to complete ignition. Timber fires are affected significantly by fuel moisture, loading, weather, and topography. Speeds can vary from slow to extremely fast. A rapidly moving timber fire presents significant danger to people. Weather also affects fire behavior. When it is not snowing or raining heavily, the three most important factors affecting fire behavior are wind, relative humidity, and temperature. Lower temperature and higher humidities help to lower the intensity of fires. Humidity especially affects fine fuels such as brush, grass, and smaller dead fuels. Wind is the most significant weather factor that affects fires. Wind increases the intensity and spread of fire. Wind feeds extra oxygen into the fire while causing the fire to preheat adjacent fuel. A heavy wind can have an explosive effect and often dictates the direction of spread. High erratic winds are the most dangerous of all. As an evacuator headed down this road, does this weather appear good or bad from a fire behavior standpoint? Experienced firefighters will tell you that this cloud, called a cumulonimbus, is potentially very bad for fire safety. The reason is that although there may be some precipitation associated with it, there will likely also be very strong and erratic winds. 
The precipitation is often heavy, but very confined and short in duration. On the other hand, the powerful and erratic winds associated with this cloud can cause a fire that was approaching containment to jump control lines and exhibit aggressive fire behavior. The third environmental factor affecting fire intensity and spread rates is topography. This includes slope, aspect, and the terrain features of the ground where the fire is burning. Slope has an obvious impact on a fire's rate of spread and to some degree its intensity. Slope mirrors one aspect of wind. It preheats adjacent fuel which causes it to ignite rapidly. Slope also determines fire direction unless opposed by a strong wind. The steeper the slope, the more significant its effect, which is fairly intuitive for most evacuators. When combined with some of the other factors mentioned earlier, slope can result in an extremely dangerous fire. When wind and slope are aligned and fuel loading is high, fire can move with amazing speed and intensity. Fires running up slope under no other effect other than the slope, often reduce significantly in intensity once at the top of the slope. For this reason, firefighters often build fire line on the opposite side of a crest that a fire is approaching. Aspect is another factor that affects slope indirectly. Aspect affects fuel temperature and moisture. Fuels on a south aspect can be drier and hotter than the same fuels on a northern aspect. In many areas, including the Blue Mountains in eastern Oregon, aspect will often dictate fuel type, with lighter grassy fuels on southern aspects and brush and timber on northern aspects. The last factor of topography which can significantly affect fire spread and intensity are terrain features. It is important for responders to recognize areas that might pose a risk due to their ability to affect fire behavior. Small intermittent drainages and draws on steep hillsides will channel and intensify a moving fire. For this reason, firefighters call them chimneys. Saddles are often more dangerous places because they are normally at the top of a large chimney and tend to concentrate fire. Deep, long drainages are often called funnels because they will change the direction of a prevailing wind and can also intensify that wind, causing a significant increase in the downwind fire behavior. By far the most destructive fire is the crown fire. When fire gets established in the crowns of trees, it can move at significant speeds with almost inconceivable intensities. The potential for a crown fire to develop depends on most of the factors we have just discussed. The most intense crown fires develop in dry stands of timber with heavy fuel loading and tight contiguous canopies. Torching occurs when a single tree's crown erupts in flames. Torching is considered a dangerous sign because it indicates that the timber is at high risk of a crown fire. Evacuators should be aware of the implication of torching if if they observe torching events such as pictured here. Often when conditions are favorable for crowning, smaller fuels such as smaller second growth trees or brush adjacent to the timber cause the fire to burn up into the canopies. Firefighters call these fuels ladder fuels because they provide surface fire a ladder to climb into the crown. Evacuators working in areas of timber with ladder fuel should be aware of this potential. Crown fires are extremely dangerous. Timber stands with tight crown spacing, usually considered less than 20 feet, are especially susceptible. Crowning under the right conditions can result in complete consumption of all fuels in the effective area and move very rapidly. One of the ways large fires spread is through the process of spotting. Spread by spotting is extremely dangerous because it is nearly impossible to suppress. Spotting occurs when large columns from form as a result of intense large fire events. 
These columns can rise many thousands of feet in the air and throw burning firebrands out in all direction. If the wind is pushing the fire, they are often thrown out in front of the moving fire. These firebrands land while still actively burning and ignite the surface fuel. Evacuators may think they are far enough away from the main fire to be safe. However, firebrands associated with powerful columns are often thrown a long distance out in front of the fire, resulting in spot fires in close proximity to evacuation operations. Long-range spotting as a result of firebrands has occurred at distances well over a mile. Columns often produce winds aloft that blow away from the column near its top, but produce strong winds and wind gusts that blow back toward the column near the surface. Spot fires come under this influence and spread rapidly back toward the flaming front. Large intense fires like those that have recently occurred in California often spread by this process. The danger for evacuation personnel is that they may be unaware that a significant long-range spotting has occurred between them and the fire front, producing a rapidly moving and growing secondary fire moving back toward the main fire with the, eva the evacuators in between. In to the 2018 campfire in California illustrates the danger of fire spread through spotting. This fire was started by electrical lines. The above map produced by the National Institute of Standards and Technology illustrates how rapidly this large fire spread by the spotting process, with multiple fires ultimately burning together to create one of the most devastating fires ever observed. At its peak, it is estimated that this fire burned 100 acres per minute. For this reason, evacuators should always be on the lookout for spotting and understand the implications what it, once it has been observed. Blow-ups, or blow-outs as they are sometimes also called, are events of large intense fire behavior. The term blow-out has been used when a fire unexpectedly exhibits this behavior, jumps established fire lines, and causes a retreat of firefighting assets. These events can be extremely dangerous due to their intense fire behavior and the confusion it often causes for fire personnel trying to understand what is happening. Blow-ups often result in what have been termed firestorms. In 2001, a fire blow-up claimed the lives of four firefighters who were fighting the 30-mile fire on the Okanagan National Forest. Two engines supported by several members of a hand crew drove up this canyon to fight a reported fire there. Along the way, they observed spot fires on both sides of the canyon. While engaged in suppression activities, more spotting occurred, which cut off the road, their only route of egress. The fire then blew up, producing a large column and moved rapidly up the canyon. The firefighters deployed their emergency fire shelters. Tragically, four still perished. The subsequent investigation revealed that the fire personnel underestimated the potential for this fire and did not understand the implications of the topography and the spot fires they were observing. It is important for evacuators to understand how a wildland fire is managed. <clears throat> wildland fires are managed using the incident command system, the same system we use to manage search and rescue incidents. Usually the person with the most knowledge of what a fire is doing initially and is expected to do are the incident commander and the operations section chief. If evacuation personnel are not part of the incident management structure, then they should always be in contact with the IC or ops chief to stay current on the fire's behavior and to identify who needs to be notified and at what levels. Initial attack on fires exhibiting intense fire behavior or unexpected blow-ups are normally periods of controlled chaos. This can be a time of much confusion as firefighters arriving on scene try to size up the fire and attempt to develop strategies and tactics to respond. It can also be a time of poor communications. Evacuators who respond to such incidents need to be aware that this confusion may exist and that a full understanding of the severity of the fire and the threats it may represent 
have not yet been fully determined. In such situation, Johnson's axiom states that the amount of control in this chaos is directly proportional to the number and experience of the responding firefighters and inversely proportional to the fire size and intensity. In other words, a rapidly moving fire and timber staffed by an insufficient number of structure engines could potentially indicate a high amount of chaos in the response and result in an incomplete picture of what is occurring. Remember, the more chaos in the initial response, the higher the potential for safety issues. Wildland firefighters had developed what they call watchout situations for wildland fire hazards. These watchouts are like red flags that should get responders' attention and may require mitigations to ensure safety. For search and rescue personnel, watchouts are similar to an AMBER evaluation in the SARGAR process. The following are watchout situations specifically designed for evacuators. Evacuation personnel have not been able to establish communications with the fire IC or op chief. If no communication with those managing the fire has been established, it is likely evacuation personnel do not know what the fire is doing or is expected to do. Fire operations personnel do not know you are out there. When this happens, the personnel with the most knowledge of the current fire status do not know to inform you of any change in fire behavior that might pose a threat. The operations section has not yet been set up. If there is no operations section chief, it usually is a sign that the IC is trying to do too many things by himself or herself, or can mean that adequate personnel are not yet on scene. Either way, it can indicate a level of chaos in the response and that the true risks have not yet been determined. Fire personnel have limited wildland fire experience. If firefighters do not have sufficient wildland fire experience, they may not be completely accurate in their evaluation of risk. This often happens when a structure company responds to a timber fire. Fire has not been scouted or sized up. It is impossible to make an accurate evaluation of risk if this has not occurred. Cannot see the main fire or are in contact with someone who can. Fire behavior can change rapidly and affect the safety of all personnel. Someone should always be able to see what the fire is doing. Wind and slope are aligned. This is a force multiplier for rapid fire spread and increased intensity. Wind, increasing or changing directions. This can rapidly change the fire behavior and cause unanticipated safety issues. Spot fires observed. This is a sign of intense fire activity and an indicator of rapid spread potential. On a long dead end road. This can be a recipe for disaster if the fire behavior increases in intensity. Think about the 30 mile fire. On ridge top or steep terrain with fire below. This is considered one of the greatest risk factors for fire personnel and one of the common elements of past fire tragedies. Safety zones not identified or present. This means that your options are limited to your escape routes. Instructions or assignments not clear. Make sure you understand exactly what your assignment is so that you do not unexpectedly go into harm's way. It is not clear to you communicate this to your supervisor. Evacuating at night during intense fire behavior. It is often difficult to assess a fire's intensity, direction, and rate of spread at night during times of intense behavior. Normally, fire behavior diminishes at night due to lower temperatures and higher humidities. When it does not, it can cause significant safety challenges. Lastly, responding to a blow-up. These are times of chaos associated with extreme fire behavior, representing a need for immediate evacuations, but with little information as to the fire's location, rate of spread, and direction. Such situations can be perilous for evacuators, as well as persons caught in the path of the approaching fire. 
Evacuators can use some of the same strategies as wildland firefighters to help ensure their safety. LCES is a good acronym to remember. It stands for Lookouts, Communications, Escape Routes, and Safety Zones. Evacuators should be able to see what the fire is doing or be in communication, com communication with someone who does. Evacuators can post a lookout at a safe high point to monitor the fire if suppression personnel have not already done so. Evacuators need to be in communication with themselves, their supervisor, suppression personnel. Evacuators need to know their escape routes and to have identified any safety zones in their area. Escape routes can be challenging. Like 30 Mile Canyon, there are many areas in eastern Oregon with only one way in and one way out. Always remember to note any cleared areas that could be used as a safety zone to escape from a running fire. Large areas of talus, clear cuts with little regeneration, or natural clearings with little vegetation can serve as a safety zone. Ideally, the radius of an effective safety zone should be eight times the height of the burning vegetation. For a crown fire, this means a fully functional safety zone would need to be in excess of 600 feet from the flaming front. Can you see any safety zones here? There are several clearings in this area that might serve as an effective safety zone. To be safe and effective, evacuators need to have some basic information about the fire causing the threat. This information is best obtained from fire personnel who should be experienced in this process. However, if the evacuators are responding during that initial period of chaos or before fire units are even on scene, evacuators will need to perform their own size up to identify safety threats, determine who needs to be evacuated, and in what priority and level. At a minimum, size up should consider the following. Size of the fire, intensity, the rate and direction of spread, and the expected fire behavior based upon a basic understanding of the fire environment triangle. Evacuators are normally not trained in fire behavior beyond the basics covered in this presentation. Evacuators should always err on the side of caution and seek experienced advice as soon as possible. Here are some aids that inexperienced evacuators can use to assess the fire. It is helpful to know where the fire was and what it was doing when first reported. Dispatch will hopefully obtain this information. Evacuators can often tell a lot about a fire based upon what it has done since the time it was reported. The column size is indicative of size and intensity. A column exceeding 500 feet should be of concern. A column raising several thousand feet indicates a blow-up. Dark colored smoke normally indicates more intense fire. Often dark smoke inside of white smoke will be observed. If the base of the fire is not visible, it can make an accurate assessment more challenging. And obviously flame lengths can be indicative of intensity. Flame lengths greater than six feet in most fuel should get your attention. The safety of wildland fire evacuators should always be the first priority. Some considerations include drive defensively to the incident. Evacuators will be in ineffective if their vehicle is damaged in an accident. Pair up whenever possible. Four sets of eyes are better than two. In addition, one evacuator can document while the other one makes contacts. Evacuators working anywhere in proximity of active fire should wear wildland fire PPE. This would include a hard hat, gloves, and Nomax if available. Remember, the synthetics we recommend for most search and rescue incidents do not react well with fire and can result in severe burns if the wearer is exposed to active fire. Always do a safety analysis prior to beginning an evacuation assignment. If you are familiar with the SARGAR process used by search and rescue, use it. When conducting operations, do not get too focused on your contacts Always remember to maintain situational awareness. As the wildland fire guys say, look up, look down, look all around. Let's see if we can put this all together in a quick scenario. 
Please pause the video and take a look at this aerial view of an area with wildland urban interface. The road label 204 is a two-lane paved highway. All other roads are gravel and dirt, single lane with turnouts. The red circles are residential structures in the area. Now resume the video. Pause the video again. An active fire is burning in the area as depicted. You are looking in a southeasterly direction. The fire is approximately five acres. It was a spot when first reported a half an hour ago. The fire is producing an approximate 200 foot column consisting of white smoke with black smoke at the column's center extending from the base about 50 feet. It is August with the last rain in mid-June. The wind is from the west at about 10 to 15 knots. It is 1,500 hours. Temperature is 93 degrees Fahrenheit. Fire units have just arrived at the junction of Highway 204 and McIntyre Road, but have not yet deployed. Answer the following questions. Is anyone threatened by this fire? What might you expect the fire to do? How would you expect the terrain to affect the fire behavior? Are there any terrain hazards present? If so, what are they? Who should be notified and in what order? What evacuation level would you use? Are there any watch out situations present? These questions are also part of the written test that accompanies this training. This concludes the fire evacuation safety training. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, you can call me at the Umatilla County Sheriff's Office in Pendleton, Oregon, or talk to any experienced wildland fire operations person. I hope you never have to use this training, but if you do, always remember, safety is our first priority. Thank you for watching.